Welcome to two guys. That's it. That's what it's called. Two guys. Two two sort of middle aged people talking about old games. Oh come on! Oh come on! Mid mid thirties is not middle aged. <laughs> I'm older than you are. Yeah, but not by much. Two two guys talking. That's what it's called. It's called two guys <laughs> talking. You're onto a real winner here. I can I can feel That's the list yeah. tuning out it's, right now. It's not. <laughs> It's no worse than some of the YouTube channels I've seen. Right, this is our top ten games ever. Uh, we've reached on a list. We've, I've basically stolen this format, but I've seen it stolen a lot. So I don't know. Who, I don't know where it originates from, but um, basically, we are we are the most recent in a long line of people who've stolen this format. We're just two sort of random guys who feel the need to put our own top ten list out there about the best top ten game ever. Disclaimer, asterisk, small print. We've, we've decided people want to hear our opinions. Okay, so, if you were anything like me, I agonised over number ten more than number one. Um, I was exactly the same. I mean, I think a good thing for the people who are, you know, listening stroke, watching um, this, it might be useful to put our list into some kind of context. We were just um, discussing off-air, effectively, about what top 10 means to us and for me it's not the, the 10 games that I've picked are not necessarily the top 10 best games ever you know in the whole universe it, it's the top 10 games that I feel had the most impact that left left a lasting effect on me you know even up until the present day they're games that I look back on now and s- still say yes they were in some way revolutionary or that um, you know they, they offered sort of unparalleled entertainment value or did something different i could have picked any number of games to you know sort of fit in this top 10 but right here right now in this moment these are the 10 that i would pick um you know that that have the lasting effect on me yeah i approached it the same way i i I also i avoided obvious ones i really didn't want to have a list that felt like every list so there are some things that aren't in my list that you might think oh like if you know me and and you you think that you can probably guess the list there might be some things in here that that or, or rather some things that aren't in here that you would expect to be in here if you know me i have um, i have an inkling on perhaps a couple i'm guessing by your recent live streams it's probably not going to be police quest one two or well in fact any of them particularly swap <laughs> That would be a, that would be a solid guess, yeah. Um, I think your your list is going to surprise me because um, I think you you are going to cover a broader range of older and newer games. Not to give too much away, I think you know my list starts in the late eighties and goes through to two thousand and six. Rather than you know sort of say oh Call of Duty or anything like that or nothing so modern or as uh, you know hip and happening as as that. A, a lot of them are older retro stuff, but you know there are, there are a couple of more modern. I say relatively modern. More modern. Yeah. Yeah, I, I reckon I can. I I, I have a feeling that we are going to have at least one game in common here. We shall in fact, see. I think I think we're only going to have one game in common. I'm predicting possibly two, but we shall see. I don't know because I think I think one of the ones that you would think would be our common game is one that I've avoided because it feels too obvious. Because I have a feeling that I know that that'll be on your list. <laughs> so, would you like to start us off with oh, your number ten? Go on then. Okay. So, so for my the, my first pick, um, 1988, I have chosen Samurai Warrior: The Battles of Usagi Yojimbo. Um, specifically for the Commodore 64. Now, this game was developed by um, Beam Software and published by Firebird. Um, at the time, I didn't really understand the license behind it. Um, Usagi Yojimbo is actually uh, a Dark Horse comic created by Stan Sakai, and it's about a sort of anthropomorphic uh, rabbit set in feudal Japan, uh, Miyamoto, Miyamoto Usagi, and he has various adventures. Looking back now, I feel that this was one of the, the standout games on the Commodore 64, um, largely because it was so ambitious in what it tried to do. It had got a sort of an open world adventure, and I'd say open world in the loosest terms, because obviously the technology really wasn't sort of geared. You couldn't do that kind of stuff on the Commodore 64 in the way that you can with modern games, but you would got this what felt at the time like a vast open world i mean okay so you scrolled uh, you know you walked across the screen to the right but you encountered various characters um you you could interact with them in a limited uh, limited fashion they there were lines of dialogue characters would react differently depending on how you 
uh, behaved, whether you sort of followed the honor system and would bow to them. Uh, if you had your sword drawn, is that obviously they would take that as an insult and would act, react aggressively and attack you. And there were a number of other sort of systems, but there also it, it was a branching adventure. There were multiple paths through um, to the end. Um, and really, for the scope, it, it wasn't until much later that I, that I actually went back and revisited the game. And yeah, it, you could finish it in about 15 minutes if you know what you're doing. But at the time, it felt like the game was much wider, much longer than um, you know you, you really got a sense of and really just the ambition it was a sense of um, you know these were developers really pushing the boundaries of what you know what what the c64 could achieve really that's my first sort of start to pretend that's that's my earlier the earliest game on my list um, largely because it it felt so revolutionary that is I'm already I'm already surprised I was not expecting that I never actually played that one although to be honest I haven't played a lot of Commodore 64 games I mean, I think the thing is, is that uh, these these lists will be influenced by the machines that we had of all the C64 games, and there there were many that I played and have played, you know, sort of more recently. This is the one that I feel, to me, has that lasting impact because it was revolutionary in its outlook and what it was trying to achieve. Even though it may not have achieved it, it was forward thinking, and um, yeah, that that's my the first game on my list. Excellent. That is a hell of a start. What about yours? Right. Here we go. Number 10 for me is from 1991 on the Amiga from Bullfrog Productions. It is Populous 2 Trials of the Olympian Gods. Uh, and it is rare for me to choose a sequel over an original, as I'm sure you know. But Populous 2 is just a, an absolute gem. It takes the ideas of Populous and it ramps them up to the point of absolute ridiculousness. It is a god game where you feel you feel that sense of um, being so powerful that the people, the people in your domain are your playthings that you can do whatever you want with, uh, and you can combine spells in these cool ways, like throwing a tornado over a like from offshore will make whirlpools that flood the land and then you can have a, a lava flow that the tornado goes into and it'll spew fire out everywhere and it's just so much fun it's just it's 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 a decadent game is what it is it's a game where you can sit and, and feel like a sort of you can really feel like a greek god sat eating grapes and, and going ha ha look at the mortals it's just uh, it's just incredible it's an incredible game uh, I want I want to say that there's nothing like it, but of course, um, Peter Molyneux sort of spent the rest of his career making similar games. But uh, Populous Two for me is just it's a, it's such a special and unique thing, even compared to the first game, which is so sort of rigid. Uh, something something about Populous Two just just it opens everything up. It opens it opens up a whole world, not just of exploring a game systems because the actual systems in the game are are quite complex but mostly um, automated so there's a lot going on that you don't really have to worry about too much you can just sort of sit there and choose oh well I'll throw some fire at these guys I'll throw some lightning bolts see what that does let's up, open up a big chasm and watch people fall into that uh, but yes Populous 2 Trials of the Olympian Gods uh, an amazing an amazing game uh, it was so much scope, so much depth. I just love it. And I would say that it, I have played it. I would agree with your choice, particularly over um, choosing it over the original. I think whilst a lot of people think that, well, I mean, the, the original Populous is um, a classic and it broke broke the mould and, and all that. Like you say, I found it to be fairly inaccessible. I, I couldn't fathom it out where there's with Populous 2 you could pick it up, you could understand the mechanics in that you need to create land for people to place their settlements and yeah. the more settlements that you got the more your godly powers grew and the more power that you got the more horrific spells you could unleash on yes. you know, your opponent's land and of course you weren't limited to spells is that you could use uh, the papal magnet to sort of summon a hero in which case your, your uh, sort of fleshy minions will sort of walk towards the, the magnet and fuse into a, a hero that will then wander the land spreading decay and destruction yeah and there were different types of heroes like uh, the, the gorgon would turn people into stone and there was there was one the one i particularly liked would just walk around uh, gathering people i think it was a siren would walk around gathering people and then would just walk into the sea and all those people would follow him that was my number 10 then right 
so moving on to the uh, the ninth position on my list, uh, it, it is an Amiga game, 1991 Moonstone, A Hard Day's Night. <sighs> I, oh yes, <laughs> oh, this is a hell of a game. Go on. It, I, the reason why this one made the list um, when I was thinking about it is that this this game has the honour it is the only game where I have faked an illness to, uh, to stay at, at the time to stay off school longer than I needed to uh, I, I can clearly remember sort of uh, affecting a cough uh, to make out that oh I really was far too ill to go back just yet because I hadn't yet mastered the game and this was a real experience so for people who are not familiar with it the game was developed by Rob Anderson and uh, published by Mindscape I think it was it's a role playing game but I consider this to be perhaps one of the earliest examples of an action RPG earlier than Diablo ever was but perhaps not in the, the sort of sense of Diablo in, in it. This is more like an arcade game. In fact, it feels more like a tabletop board game, but with real-time video game elements to it. So, the basic gist of the, the story is is that the uh, the druids have summoned their champion knights. Um, they've sent them on a quest to find the elusive moonstones, and the, uh, the knight that is able to retrieve uh, a moonstone and defeat the guardian at Stonehenge, um, if they can return to the druids with their the moonstone they will be uh, there will be a ritual and they will ascend to into the heavens as a, as a god each player starts at, uh, in a different quadrant of the game map and within each sort of zone there are a number of different layers within which the player has to enter and fight against the monstrosities lurking within uh, the lair and uh, they they are monstrosities oh this is a game that gets progressively harder throughout the, the difficulty goes completely off the deep end although i think that that is by design because with each layer that you conquer um, you gain experience points which you can spend to increase your stats so obviously to sort of level out the playing field they don't want players to get too overpowered so um, the opponents get stronger you face more of them and the, the enemies that you face will vary between each of the zones so um, let's say in the the forest area you'll find rat men that sort of live in the trees and attack you with their claws and will try and strangle your knights by they'll sort of hang their tails down and if you wander in um, you will come to a pretty grisly death hanging from a, a fairly rope-like tail in the northern wastelands you'll face the the sort of vicious the i believe they're called ballocks uh, giant sort of hairless well quite that the sort of like minotaur type creatures sort of all you know tusks and teeth and yeah, they'll pick you up and shake you around and uh, bite your head off if your health is too low and i think that this is one of the main selling points of why the game um, was so popular is that this has a level of gore that makes mortal kombat one look pathetic um, but this, the, it didn't have any rating on the box as far as I'm aware but the gore in this is uh, somehow more realistic and more horrifying by the fact that it's hand drawn you know th this isn't just a sort of blob of digital tomato ketchup that falls out is that you know if you stick a sword into someone you, you can have sucking chest wounds and impalings and all kinds of uh, horrific deaths. My favourite being, um, if anybody remembers the swamp level, um, the sort of blue trolls that carry the tree trunk. That um, <laughs> yes. if you get, uh, I mean, getting hit by one is bad enough, but if you're, uh, they will reduce you to a, a bloody paste, literally. Uh, they hit you on the head, and your arms and legs fly off in all directions. It's quite a treat to watch, I, I must say. But on, on a gameplay front, yeah, it, it was, it had got that level of accessibility that sort of turned me off from role-playing games back in the day i mean whilst things like dungeon master and whatever and uh, you know the sort of the gold box games from uh, ssi were great games is that i found them uh, you know a bit too number heavy whereas moonstone it got that sort of upgrade path and it got all the, the sort of the dice rolling and the stats behind the behind the scenes but it was still an arcade game first and foremost and it was that level of accessibility that yeah it was clearly one of the best games of, of its time i mean it is it is really uh, a phenomenal thing moonstone yeah it's funny you mentioned the the monsters in the swamp because my favorites were always the 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 mud monsters who would just this this game had jump scares before jump scares were like <laughs> a thing in games i remember these things would just 
pop out of the ground and it would play this big this uh, violin sting. And sometimes if he got if he got caught off guard by that, that was an instant death. Because <laughs> they'd just grab you and pull you into the dirt with them. Oh, I loved it. What a game. Great choice. Right. That is a hell of a that is a hell of a number nine. That if I'd thought of that, that might have been that might have been on my shortlist, but it just it just never came to mind for some reason. So my number nine, quite quite different. It's from 1996. It is a point and click adventure game by Revolution Software, and it is Broken Sword: The Shadow of the Templars. That is a good choice. Uh, yes, it is just sublime. It's so uh, it's it's one of the few games that I would say is perfect in its in its execution of its intentions you know it is absolutely beautiful to look at it sounds great it's got this wonderful soundtrack by um a composer called barrington Felung. i think i'm pronouncing i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right but he's best known for for doing the inspector moss theme tune and he did this he does wonderful soundtrack for this it's all scored it's all scored beautifully like a film with a with a with a um with an orchestra and it's it's this brilliant mix of um globe trotting adventure and a mystery story which is all so it's so well written and it's so well constructed and beautifully um put together that i just there was nothing else like this and, and i think modern games now they, they they still struggle with this but broken sword was just oh oh it's it's i'm doing that i'm doing the uh the 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 Italian chef uh, meatball, spicy meatball, kissing the air thing now. It's so good. Broken Sword. I mean, it's hard to even put it into words because I think the best way to show how good Broken Sword is is just to look at it. Just, just, just look at how how beautiful it is. And I, I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it other than that. It was beautiful, and it was the the, the story of um, George Stobart in Paris witnesses a a bombing at a cafe, and he decides to look into it. And it leads to this whole conspiracy of, of this shadowy organisation and uh, this this plot that's been going on for, for centuries that is culminating now with this series of assassinations and um, it makes you think about who the who the heroes and the villains are, whether the, the ends justify the means and there's this there's a love story at the heart of it all. And it's just it, it's it's a game where you look at it and you think, ah, this the writing the writing is so good. I mean, I believe that this was... Is it Charles Cecil? Uh, the same... Charles yeah. Cecil, yes. I mean, I think that the, the great thing is is that the opening scene, it's George at a cafe table out, you know, just, just an ordinary guy. I believe he's just... He, you know, he's, he's nothing heroic. He's, he, he works in insurance, I believe. I think I think he, he's like a recent law school graduate. So he's not like a full-blown employed lawyer, but I think he's sort of doing some kind of legal, like patent work or something. That, yeah, and he's just on vacation, and I believe it's a clown, isn't it, that walks into the cafe? And <laughs> yes, it's a clown. A clown walks into the cafe, drops an exploding xylophone, and runs. But like you say, it, it's everything about the game. It's the quality of the um, the animation. I believe it's all hand drawn. It's not CGI at all. But it's a game of the age when CD-ROM was really coming into its own. It's you know full CD audio soundtrack, cutscenes voice acting and, yeah. and, and what voice acting I think that George himself I think voiced by Rolf Saxon um, he was absolutely brilliant in that role they did a Broken Sword director's cut sort of remastered version of this uh, where they actually put in new scenes now I wasn't a fan of this uh, even though I sort of geared myself up for it because I, I heard it, I first heard about it from the mouth of Dave Gibbons the comic book artist because um, I met him and I got him to, to autograph the prologue comic from Beneath the Steel Sky. And he told me, he said, oh, I've been doing some more work for these. I've, I've, we're doing, they're doing a Broken Sword remastered version. I'm drawing all these, all these new character portraits for them. And I was like, oh my god! Because that was the first I'd heard of it from Dave Gibbons himself. Uh, so yeah, that was that was like a great moment for me, but um, the, the game itself was a disappointment, the, the remastered version. And if you've ever played that, it, it really detracts from the beauty of the of the original by adding on all these all these new scenes and with 3D models and a lot of the old animations and graphics are just not not there anymore, not complete. I think I think if anyone if anyone out there is listening to this who has not played Broken Sword, they absolutely need to. It is it is just sublime masterpiece. So that's my bro that's my number nine, Broken Sword. 
Shadow of the Templars. Excellent choice. I would pick it myself, definitely. Good. Right, moving on to number eight in my list. Um, oh. Perhaps one that might not surprise you. Um, oh, okay. Another Amiga game. Oh. 1993. I know what it the is. Chaos yes. Engine. <laughs> Uh, by the legendary the Bitmap Brothers, um, one of the the first true rock star um, video game development studios, uh, a Britsoft legend. Um, of all the games that they produced, I think it, it was a toss up between um, the Chaos Engine and Speedball 2 Brutal Deluxe. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, the Chaos Engine edges it out. Um, I am a huge fan of this game, and I've, even though it was released on PC and Mega Drive and SNES and you know other systems for me the Amiga version is the definitive version it, it it's a game which um, it's everything that the Amiga is and was uh, the graphics the sound the ability to design complex gameplay elements you know the, the kind of stuff that really consigned the 8-bit machines to, to the garbage heap really um, so the, the game it's sort of set in a fictionalized ver version of sort of Victorian era I suppose London I suppose you know the sort of the UK it's, it's got a very British yeah. feel to it but um, it, it centers around a sort of an, an, an enigmatic uh, sort of mad professor type character called Baron von Fortescue who has designed and come up with um, a sort of a, an early steam powered computer known as the chaos engine um, quite why he's doing this it, 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 that's never discussed it's uh, you know he just is he's just tinkering around in his basement one day and comes up with um, you know sort of the kind of machine that would make Charles Babbage pretty proud it's uh, but in the sort of the, the sort of stereotypical trope of these sort of things the machine turns against its master um, it goes haywire and rips a, a hole in the time space continuum and uh, all kinds of monstrosities break through from parallel dimensions into the the real world and you know of course who's going to come and clean up this mess um the answer is is in the in the title um sequence that that excellent title sequence with that superb soundtrack by by joy um f was it six hard-bitten mercenaries <laughs> for hire um because, of course, the government is in, and any sort of official body, military, is completely unable to uh, deal with this situation. But just get six random Joes with, uh, you know, bringing along their torches and pitchforks um, to clean up the mess. But it is those six characters which make the game really a large part of why it was so successful. Um, so you get a choice of different characters, each with their own abilities, strengths, weaknesses, uh, different weapons. Um, you've got your stereotypical tough guys, you know, got real meathead characters, but who have the, the most powerful weapons, the, the thug and the navvy. Um, you have your sort of uh, jack of all trades, the, uh, the brigand and the mercenary. And then you have your uh, more cerebral characters, um, ones that tend to be leaner and faster, but can't take quite so many hits. Uh, you have the gentleman and the priest. So the, the actual game is a sort of a three quarter top down view um, arcade shooter. Um, in which you progress through a series of levels, each of which is just divided into a number of different um, zones. There's, there's four levels in each world. Each world has got its own sort of graphical theme with different traps and different elements to it. And the objective in each of these levels is to find and activate a number of nodes. Um, the nodes are pretty much required to open the exit to the uh, the next level. But uh, the main sort of attraction to the main part of each level is, is finding your way through the uh, the sort of maze-like sort of constructs. There are, there are multiple ways through each level. There are keys which open um, secret areas to other sort of hidden bonus areas. There's um, you know, all kinds of triggers behind the scenes. You know, you walk over certain things and it'll activate. Uh, monsters will rush out from, you know, various parts of the scenery. It's, it's a very dynamic uh, game and even the sort of the best part of 20 30 years on is that even playing it now is that I'm still finding new elements uh, you know things that activate in the game that I simply didn't know about and of course it's got a, a superb graphical style by, uh, by Dan Malone who is one of uh, the bitmap brothers um, extremely talented artists um, 
and also music by Richard Joseph. Uh, it, I think it's one of the first games that I remember that had dynamic audio in that when you got close to the level exit, the tempo would change and it would get you know quite uh, quite tense and quite pumping as you found the, uh, the the level exit. And really, there was just so much about the game that was revolutionary, not least the AI. The big hook for this is that even though you could play with two players, what they implemented was um, an artificial intelligence that would play uh, the other character if you were playing by yourself so that you'd always got that um, buddy experience and what an AI it is it's really one of the, the great thing about it is it, it feels like a real person it reacts to the enemies it will pick up items um, but it's you know it's got its weaknesses it, it which you can also um, you can upgrade the character statistics throughout by spending the money that you get from killing monsters but you can upgrade its effectiveness in combat and it's the AI actually improves and it's one of those things whereby if you didn't realize it was a machine controlling this it, it, it could be another person it it, it doesn't the standard is, is that good. I mean, this is a fun, this is another phenomenal game, and also this is this is one of the ones that I knew would be on your list. As soon as you said 1993, I thought that, no, that is. But it's interesting that this came out in '93 because uh, the Amiga was kind of on its on its way out at that point, um, and this came along and just showed everyone that hey, this machine still got uh, still still got some life in it. Yeah, it's just one of those games. It, it's got replayability. But what I would say is is that. The version that I'm picking is the original, the, the OCS ECS version, mm -hmm. um, the one that was done in the original Amiga color palette. What the Bitmap Brothers did is that when the Amiga 1200 came out uh, and the CD32 is that uh, obviously Commodore were looking for developers to support the new machine. So what they did is they went back to Chaos Engine and they updated the, the artwork with additional colors and for me, it really added nothing to the game. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. This is this is one I have in my collection, and it is. I think it's the box I own that has been the most damaged by me, because it's been opened probably more than any of the others. <laughs> it's well fun. Yeah, it, it. Even when I'm not playing it, I I still want to get it down and just look at it. I love it. Yeah, what a great game. It's not on my list, but um, it nearly was. I did consider it. You knew yeah, I knew it was going to come up in your list. So I thought, you know what? I don't need to. It's going to get talked about. It's great. <laughs> One of the major contributing factors um, to to why the bitmaps uh, games were so polished was Eric Matthews, uh, sort of principal designer on all of their games, who was a stickler for for quality who would you know go over things over and over again until he felt that the game was absolutely right and ready to be released and i th i think that the chaos engine it feels like the pinnacle of that process of refinement i really cannot find anything wrong with it apart from perhaps say the final boss which is you know a, a bit of a letdown to well that's not a problem for me because i never actually got that far <laughs> I have guided you here so that you might set a free. My number eight is from 1996 on the PC. It's yeah, it's another one from 96, and it is a first-person shooter, wow. and it is Quake. You do surprise me. Do I? Yes, Quake is for me. Um, it's kind of this is gonna almost sound pretentious I think when I say this but um, I always feel like Quake was the ultimate game in a way it, it's kind of the game that once they made it games sort of stopped evolving it was like that was it that that's the the entire industry saw Quake and he said that's it that's what games are going to be now from it forever if you play any modern shooter any any modern game really it plays like Quake it looks like Quake your life is Quake and um it still plays phenomenally. I mean, it's it's probably the game on my list that if anyone, if 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 anyone who's played a game, who's not played a game older than like five years, if they picked up Quake, uh, they'd feel right at home. They they really just have not developed like game mechanics. You know, I realise I'm being very general here. Obviously, there's still phenomenal games that come out, but in a lot of ways, whenever I look at particularly mainstream games and and especially first person shooters. It just seems like mechanically they never, they really never even bothered to move on from Quake. It's like, why would you? They nailed it. Now, in terms of making your list, are you focusing on this from the single player um, content, or were you? Did you get to experience the multiplayer? Because I know that Quake was 
pretty much one of the games that really kick-started the multiplayer revolution. It really, really, I'm talking about both. It's it's the single player and the multiplayer. Um, the way that you explore it in Quake, because because Quake's coming coming from off the back of Doom, and it was the first time they had really fully 3D environments and, and objects, and the design of that 3D, it really feels like they put a lot of care and, and thought into what's the difference now between what we can do in 3D and what we were doing before in 2D. Uh, so there's, there's there, are, there are all these sections where it's like, okay, you have to look up. You have to jump over um, like a huge gap. You can drop down this big drop, this big chasm into some water and it'd be fine. And so I think I think that as well, that the level design and everything in the, in the single player game. In the multiplayer though, what was coming about, what was evolving was this this complexity of movement that that the game actually allowed you to do so you could if you play through the single player you might never realize that you can rocket jump or run along walls or do these jump further if you're strafing and things like that and i think i think it really it was perhaps the start of like really heavy heavy meta gaming in in video games which um is something that i kind of have a bad taste for now but i do think it's interesting when you look back in, in, look back at it there in Quake and see how see how um, it, it evolved all of these interesting ideas that we that we sort of they're in the the common language now. I mean, rocket jumping and, and strafe jumping and things like that. People people talk about that all the time, but um, you know, it all started in Quake. I think that Quake. I mean, it was a classic example of it upping the ante. I mean, the the world had been wowed by Doom, um, and then you'd had other sort of developers playing catch up with. You know the sort of two and a half D stroke three D, but still primarily bitmap powered um, engines. You know th- stuff like the build engine, and then it just blew the world away again with uh, Quake. And I recall that I, I, I got the shareware episode. Um, it was like a seven disc pack, and I remember getting it from a, a computer trade show because internet still really wasn't a thing, and it was made to pay for it. You know they weren't giving these away. It was like you're paying ten pounds for seven discs with a shareware, but <laughs> it was. It was like the first episode of the game, and yeah. it was just absolutely revolutionary. But one thing that I would sort of add to this is that also at the time is that when Quake came out, it was still um, it was still in the infancy of sort of 3D accelerated um, graphics. It, it still got a, a software render, and I remember when uh, 3D FX graphics cards came out, Quake was like one of the. It became the poster child for. Um, sort of 3D graphics because GL Quake came out, you know, a, a patch that supported uh, 3D FX's uh, Glide API, and it added bilinear filtering and texture smoothing, and it just made the game. It it looked absolutely incredible, and it ran at a, a frame rate beyond um, what the CPU could manage alone, and it was it was a real turning point for the industry and. Yeah, what better game to have it in than Quake? Yeah, and it wasn't even just the industry. I think it, I think it changed the way that players were looking at games. I think it changed um, the way players thought about the hardware that they were using to play games. It was really, I mean, it just, uh, I mean, I, I'm trying to write avoid using pretentious words, but you know, it was a benchmark. It was, it was a benchmark, and I think in a, in a sense, it is the benchmark even now. Um, every game is still, I think, trying to chase. It's chasing the quick. <laughs> it's chasing the quick. That was that for you? So that's it. That's my number eight. Quick. Good choice. So moving on to the seventh game in my list, another game from 1993, and I'm sort oh. of cheating a bit here because um, it's two platforms. But I'll, I'll come to why that is. So my seventh choice is Syndicate by Bullfrog Productions. Oh, okay. Um, I think of of all Bullfrog's games, I think that this is the one that I remember. Um, the most fondly and probably the one that had the most impact on me is that um, I remember getting a demo of the game uh, on Amiga Action magazine and it was just a single mission but it was I had never experienced a game like this you know this was the first example I'd played of pretty much a real-time strategy game you know real-time tactical strategy whereby you've got um, units that you moved about a game world with the mouse and again, it's worth saying that the Amiga for me was a machine of many firsts. You didn't get to experience like anything like this on any other machine at, at the time. And so Syndicate was like a real revolution. In that, I recall that um, I think that you know Peter Molyneux said that oh, with Populous we've simulated 
uh, a world and you know there, there are other games but in in syndicate they were simulating a city so the basic backstory is sort of heavily influenced by um cinema like the, the terminator and and sort of similar cyberpunk type stuff blade runner we're in a, a, a future world where you know, a dystopian environment where mega corporations um, you know they're, they're pulling all the strings governments are you know, they're just their puppets um, you know it, it's big corporations that run the world now and this one corporation Eurocorp comes up with um, a device known as the chip which is inserted at the back of uh, you know a person's neck and it's like the ultimate hallucinogenic the ultimate drug uh, completely distorts the person's perception reality it makes them think that they're uh, you know celebrities make you know they, they become godlike in their own minds um, and it's a way of them avoiding the sort of drudgery of normal daily life and so the, the corporations realize that the, the syndicate that controls the production of chips uh, will effectively run the world and so what what ensues is a corporate warfare a literal corporate warfare on a massive scale whereby these mega corporations battle it out for control of the chip supply and thus the world and you take on the role of a, an executive within the Eurocorp well it, it actually it's not Eurocorp that comes in the, the second game it, it's any syndicate you, of your choosing but in sort of canon law it's Eurocorp and then you um, you take your sort of squad of cyborg agents into various cities around the world uh, and undertake missions uh, combat enemy agents deal with local law enforcement have to um, persuade people to join your cause literally um, persuade a Tron being one of the standout pieces of equipment and me mechanics in this game but uh, it, it sort of it was again it was one of those sort of revolutionary experiences whereby you you directed your units to positions on the map by clicking um, you, you'd got that sort of tech tree you've got research development you've got a sort of monetary uh, budget and expenditure all the, the sort of elements about a game that I that I enjoy um, all rolled into a single game and the, the sort of real-time combat um, this was just you know the game for me and I recall I, I had a friend round and you know th this friend was sort of used to Mega Drive and Super Nintendo and playing Street Fighter 2 and I roll out this game it's like oh yeah you'll, you'll love this game you'll find it absolutely fantastic and he's just watching these you know sort of four pixel high ants on the screen <laughs> walk around and so occasionally I was you know it, it, I think it was kind of lost on people that, what, that weren't fans of that particular genre but what a game and it also holds the uh, the distinct honour being the only game that I have ever bought on more than one platform. So I, I first got it on the Amiga, um, loved it to bits. But then I can't remember why, where I saw it. I know it was on television. That it was a, a sort of a news article about the rise of the PC, and they showed two games. One of which was the PC version of Syndicate, and being intimately familiar with the Amiga version, um, it was a, it was a, a, an amazing effort that they got it to run on uh, an Amiga 500 put it that way and when I saw the PC version with uh, you know sort of VGA graphics with a high, better color palette and I realized that really the PC was coming into its own and you know from that point on was that I, I wanted this game on PC as well I wanted a PC I remember when syndicate came out um, obviously I was very young at the time but I remember thinking that's the future of games and in a sense it was because it sort of had this the, this open exploration and this this high level of violence didn't make my list because the thing is like a, a lot of my favorite games are bullfrog games and i had to i could probably do a top 10 <laughs> top 10 bullfrog games um but but uh, syndicate would probably be like the fourth one on that list that gives me some insight into what might be appearing on your list later yes i, I suspect you can probably guess one of my later games <laughs> um it, it's worth it, it, I mean, Syndicate, it's interesting. Um, it originally was envisioned to have multiplayer, which didn't make it into the base game. That wouldn't come until the American expansion um, add-on pack, uh, which I never really got into because the missions were harder. And I think by the time it came out, you know, there was new and shinier stuff to be um, playing. Still, still a fine game, but I think it didn't have the same impact as the, the original base game. And then they took the... the 
the formula and then they really refined it with Syndicate Wars and whilst that doesn't make my list it's one of those games that I went back and really had a better appreciation for what they were trying to achieve after um, you know after the fact yeah that is a that is a solid choice Syndicate and it also has the best smelling game manual ever <laughs> Yes, this is this is like the eighth time you've mentioned this to me. Um, I have this in my collection, and I and I have sniffed the manual in it. In I my... told you, open that manual and give it a good sniff. That it is quality paper. You will never find a better manual. It's it really is it really is uh, quite something. Uh, they put out quality games. This was EA at the height of uh, this is before EA were like the worst company. This is when they were like. The best game publisher, yeah, it did. They used to be the best, but they're the worst now. But yeah, they they put these games out in these beautiful boxes. So that was number seven. So here's my number seven. It's from 1993. I'm trying to draw out suspense here because I want to see if you uh, can guess what this is. It's from 1993. It is. I think of it as an Amiga game, but it was also released on the PC. Uh, the reason I think of it as an Amiga game is because it was actually really, and still is really. One of the most technically impressive Amiga games because it would react to how powerful your Amiga was. The better your machine was, the better this game was. Hired guns? <sighs> nope. It is the Settlers. Oh, good choice. Oh, the Settlers. I've had many, 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 many hours of uh, bliss playing this game. It is like it's like a dream. The Settlers is a game about building a society that is effectively self-governing but constantly in need of expansion but the pace is so relaxing it's so it's so nice to look at the the beautiful green landscape and and watch your little men carry lumber to the building sites as you tell them to build a new a new house over by the river go and build a new a fisherman's hut over there and the fishermen will fish and catch fish, and the fish will go to the miners because the miners need food. Miners will extract uh, metal and coal and gold, which will be smelted at the smelters, and the smelters will take the the gold will go to the knights, and the metal will go to the the production uh, houses, and and it's just it's just wonderful to to watch this and to and it makes you want to keep expanding it. You want to see just how big you can make these your society. Oh, it's such a beautiful game. Um, I mean, this is the sort. This is the sort of game that you know. It's not just economics. That you know, this is micro economic and macro economics. It, it's an entire um, society. And like you say, is that despite your initial involvement, is that the world carries on without you? Is that the the the, the settlers, the the workers, is that they will carry on carrying out their tasks? And really, that you have very little involvement in fact it could become the sort of most dynamic screensaver that you've ever seen <laughs> if if that's how you wish to play it. it it could yeah i mean generally it's i would say it it is a real time strategy game but the strategic element of it is um just to expand just keep expanding because the actual combat is out of your hands <laughs> you don't you don't get you don't really get any input into the combat. You train your you, you, you put knights into guard huts which go around the borders. They need gold. If knights have gold they'll they'll fight better. And they need to be trained, which means you basically to train them, all you do is swap them. You swap the ones that have been out for a while who haven't done anything, send them back to the castle where they'll become stronger, then send the stronger ones back out. That's just, that's your essentially your input into the combat in in, in the settlers. It is a game about a striving labour force that you have that your only real input in is telling them to keep growing just keep growing keep expanding and they will and the maps can get huge uh, i've got a i've got um a twelve thirty, and it runs on mine with the full features so it's like the size of the map is um incredible it, i mean not not compared to you know modern games but yeah to play on these huge maps you can be playing for days trying to fill these maps up and and for no other reason other than that you just want to see it fill up because it's just an absolute blissful uh, game of constantly thinking okay what do we need over here this place this area needs more food production so let's plant a little let's have a little field uh, a little farm and you'll watch your farmer come out and plant his his wheat and 
it'll gradually grow and then he'll come out and harvest it with his little scythe and that'll go off to a windmill and the wind the miller will turn it into flour and then that'll go to a baker and the baker will gradually bake it into loaves of bread and then the loaves of bread will go to the miners and the miners will produce ore and coal and it is just it's this the wonderful cycle of uh, of human endeavor and you can as you chop down the trees you can get a forester who will go out and yeah. sort of replant and you when you look at your thriving sort of empire effectively is that you sit back with a sort of rather smug look on your face and bask in how, how glorious it all is that is until the um, your knight loses uh, a battle and then the territory shrinks and then any buildings yeah. that are within within the decreasing circle of influence <laughs> go up in smoke. Yeah, they will be just immediately set on fire. Um, but what's great about the settlers is uh, to recover from a, a, a loss of ground like that, you just expand the other way. The more you expand, the stronger you are. So if, if your borders are getting pushed into... Um, you could actually gain more ground by going the other way, and then you'd be stronger to push back. And that's that's the real that's the real strategy of the settlers. It's just about it's about expanding. That's all you all you really need to be thinking about in the settlers is how do I grow? How do I how, how do I grow? What do I need over here? What do I need over here? And just about making the most efficient sort of system of roads and um, cycle of food and, and resources and just it's it's. Ah, it's it's hypnotic in its beauty. I love it. That's it. Whew. An emotional one. That <laughs> I feel very strongly. I, I can I can feel you welling up. Oh, it's uh, it's it's a game that I feel very strongly about. That one. Okay, so that was number six. No, it wasn't. That was number seven. Getting ahead of yourself. Yeah. Right. So moving on to number six, and um, in in rather a sort of similar genre. Um, so I, when I was talking about Syndicate, I said that it was one of two games that made me realise that um, you know that the PC was what I wanted next as my sort of next upgrade. That that was the way forward. The next game on my list is the second game um, that made me realise that I wanted a PC and that the Mega was sort of heading for the the hills. Really, it was coming to the end of its life. The sixth game on my list, 1994, SimCity 2000 on PC. Mm-hmm. Okay, no, oh, that is a surprise. That is a surprise. So again, it was it was the same television news article where they showed um, you know the up and coming PC and the other game that I, when I saw it that I thought yes that is absolutely the future. I have to play this. Um, I didn't necessarily know at the time what it was. They it had just got the caption at the bottom. I didn't understand anything about it, but it was it was the graphics and the um, the sort of for the time realistic depiction of an urban environment and the, the management and the simulation um, it, it sort of struck a chord with me and I absolutely wanted it. The game was developed by uh, Will Wright and Fred Haslam at Maxis, um, a, a studio of renown really, came up with some of the best um, simulation games you know, throughout the, the mid uh, 90s and even into the 2000s. Um, I never got to play the original SimCity. Uh, I think that the visuals kind of put me off, but SimCity 2000 with that sort of high colour S, um, SVJ graphics. Essentially what you do is you build and run a city, but it's got the, the sort of intricacies of urban planning that you wouldn't expect that you would find enjoyable. Um, sort of setting out zones for uh, residential areas, industrial, um, commercial. The, the fact that, much like the settlers, is that you... So, it's the kernel of a, a sort of a virtual civilization. You get to see the world evolving in front of your eyes, and you know, at the the end, you realise that, that this is your creation. You've helped nurture this city that has sprung out of literally nothing, and it sort of lives and dies by the decisions that you make. I mean, you become responsible for everything. Do you want to legalise gambling to make bring in extra revenue into the city's coffers? Do you want to run education programmes that boost the uh, the sort of intelligence levels of your population? that sort of pulls it out of the, the sort of the smoke belching industrial type industries to bring in clean green you know tech law those kind of businesses to your city all that deep simulation that really i'd never experienced anything like it before sort of coming up with a, a traffic network you could see that if around the industrial zones is that um you would actually see cars on the road it, that the the head 
the heavier traffic would actually be there would be a graphical representation of it. And it was just like I'd never seen this before. And then you know you have to come up with water distribution, sewage, that that kind of stuff. You have to have a, a water network to to make sure that all the buildings in the the city, you know, that they've got access to the resources so that they can flourish. Otherwise, residents will leave, and you you will actually see that they the artists had gone to the effort of creating tile sets for abandoned buildings you would see that your once uh, thriving communities would be reduced to dark ashen slums of you know full of waste it was really quite remarkable for the time i played very little of this um but i played a lot of the original SimCity. i understand that SimCity 2000 is really more really more of a game because SimCity, the original SimCity was was a very small map and it was the level of challenge was essentially about getting power to the buildings and um having fire stations in the right places and that was essentially it I mean, I know that the, the sort of simulation model is probably considered... I don't like to say basic, because I think that there's still a, a huge amount of stuff going under the hood, but, you know, oh, every you know every three or four blocks, oh, I need to put down a new police station, oh, I need to have a hospital, or else residents will start getting a bit tetchy about it. <laughs> but even so, it made you think about things. You know, once your city gets to a sufficient size, it's like, well, when you first start out, you can get away without having any police stations, but unless you want to live in a chaotic, lawless society, you've got to invest in law enforcement. And it's not just a case of putting police stations down. There are various sort of switches you can throw to sort of turn on civic programs you know additional like neighborhood watch schemes that will really eat into your city's coffers if you're not careful but can you can reap uh, additional benefits by switching them on it's a it becomes quite a, a delicate balancing act and one of the things i made a note of is it once you get sort of into the mid game it becomes quite a delicate balancing act of managing expansion versus rising costs in that when you start out when you found your city i think you you have a budget of you know sort of half a million dollars and you think yeah i can go wild with this but it's very easy to eat through that initial budget in the first 10 20 minutes of gameplay you i mean you have to buy a power plant and in certainly if you start in like uh, the 1950s because that's when you start a new game you have the option of whether you start sort of start in more historic times or the, the then as it was the sort of modern era with cleaner more uh, efficient power uh, you pl- plop down a coal uh, power plant or a gas station and that's really going to eat into your budget and that comes back to bite you later on particularly when you realize that the power plants have a finite lifespan is that eventually they will collapse and you know go up in smoke and that you have to renew them so the decisions that you make early on will have a you know a lasting impact and you really have to get quite good at managing the game and the sort of requirements of your of your population if you actually want to turn a profit yeah it's an interesting choice that uh, i wish i had more to say i wish i had more to add but i, I really don't i don't have any much experience with that one but that's my uh, my number six choice okay well my number six is actually along similar lines really and it is um it's a pc it was well it was on the pc and the amiga it's from 1991 and it is Sid Meier's Civilization. Good choice. Uh, yeah, it's a similar thing to SimCity because it does have so much in the way of simulation um, and things that you have to consider. And I just, it, it, it's it's a game of such depth and um, of such scope. It's a game that I, I I never felt could be improved upon. It's got about it's I think there's there there's six of them now. There's Civilization six is out. Uh, I've never played any of the sequels because I've never felt the need to. If I want to play Civilization, I will. I'll just play Civilization, <laughs> and I'll have a good time doing it because it's it's a phenomenal game. It is a game about developing cultures, and I think that's something that I've never really seen done well anywhere else. Uh, developing a culture, having having um, luxuries, and and building up from simple irrigation to uh, to, to to massive aqueducts and things, and and more complex sewage systems and things like that and infrastructure and and as you build up your infrastructure new problems emerge like uh, pollution your political system is 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 informed by 
or rather informs uh, your culture because I mean a lot of I mean there, there is a sort of meta game around this and I've, I've heard a lot of people say it's the race the race to communism so, to win civilization it's the race to communism because as soon as you hit communism you can kind of just um, get away with anything uh, but there is that that idea like if so if you're if you have a democratic um, country then people will get very upset when the soldiers are away so if you send soldiers out to war uh, your people in your in your Cities are going to start refusing to work because you know they miss their their families and and it's and they they object to to war and conflict. They don't want the soldiers to leave and go and go off to die. Whereas there are other forms of government whereby if you have um, military units stationed in the city, it has the, the, the same effect: is that people don't like having the military forces it, yes, bring and, down um, their necks on home turf. As well, it, it also informs like the resources that you can get. You know, for example, in in if you have communism and or feudalism then there's going to be more agriculture if you are if you are have if you have democracy then it's going to be more of a, more of a scientific kind of people are, people are going to want to push for, for better things but so you're always thinking about the culture that not just it's not just a war game it's like what's what's going on in the, in these cities that I'm building what's the culture what's uh, what's progress look like for me right now it's a game where you're you are you are sort of leading this civilization, but you're leading it over centuries. So you're almost like a spirit of of uh, this this civilization's entire existence, and it is really a fascinating game to just to, to, to even think about now. For me, I think it's it's an interesting one because it's actually it can be a lot deeper. I mean, on the surface level, yes, you're running an empire. Well, you're building an empire to, you know, you want to be the one, the last civilization standing. But the amount of detail that is in this game, um, it sort of, it really charts human evolution, at least up until the point when, you know, the game itself was made. Taking your, effectively, a tribe from, you know, not quite the Stone Age, but throughout the various phases of you know humans evolution with the pretty much from the discovery of fire you know there yeah. is a tech tree that is extremely deep it's like the, the discovery of writing the coded alphabet uh, the wheel and each of these discoveries has a profound effect on what um, new technologies your civilization gets access to it's as much a, a, a history lesson as anything else is that really these things that we take for granted is that you look at the tech tree and you think oh yes I will re decide to research you know either nuclear fusion or uh, I will decide to research uh, gunpowder but really when you think about it all these scientific discoveries in the back of your mind there's this there's the realization of the impact it's mm. had on sort of real yeah I mean that, that's, as well. that's what's great about it because it's because essentially the the, the wind condition is a race to, to build a spaceship and get into space uh, and so if you if you're aware that there's a civilization who is might be getting there before you you kind of left with no choice of it but to really start hampering them um, and sometimes it can be a civilization that you haven't even encountered yet because there'll be times when you're doing you feel like you're doing really well but but you've never been to the to the other continent and there'll be there'll be two civilizations over there who are who are just doing gangbusters and you just can't even get to them you need to start getting over there and when you go over there and you meet them for the first time you might find that you just need to knock them back a bit and it's that strange feeling it's it's the similar feeling to populous 2 where um the people are, are almost are almost like just just play things they're like um you know their, their individual existence doesn't matter but in civilization while you can sometimes think that the actual reality of it is is um much more realistic it feels much more like okay this has an impact because every soldier that guy send out to die uh, has an impact on its on his home city Every uh, every military loss in this game is like represents sometimes represents years of because uh, if if each turn is a year then some sometimes some of these things can take years to build and it represents years of uh, of endeavor to send out a ship that immediately gets sunk and also like solitaire they say that you know solitaire is a sort of game where you you can't win every game there are some games which are unwinnable mm. from the start and sometimes I found that that it feels the same with civilization in that 
um, because obviously the, ran the the worlds are procedurally generated. You can specify the, the the conditions under which the game will start. You know whether you want more uh, larger continents, you want islands or whatever. But sometimes it deals you a really bad hand <laughs> in that it puts you in the middle of the Arctic where there's no food, no water, and then the first hut that you wander into. Oh look, you've unleashed a barbarian <laughs> tribe. That, yes, um, definitely. That, that's definitely a factor. But I I always I always want to see a game of civilization through to the end no matter what because it's like every single time you play it it's this unique narrative it's this whole world it's a story of an entire world that you just need to see through to the end the games just stopped for you after 1991 that was it civilization that's it well i mean seen it done essentially it. i i always say that any game that came out after 2008 is uh, is a cut off for me but if you were to look at this list i mean the cut off is much earlier <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do often think that whenever I play newer games, they always remind me of something that I've already played. When I think of the idea of a game and what everything that a game can be, Civilization's kind of one of those ones that comes to mind. And I think, yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of that's the everything game. That's the game. That's that's everything. And when I think of that, I don't think of big graphics and very impressive visuals. I think of. Um, extremely deep and complex systems that make for interesting stories and that's what civilization does it just makes for endless amounts of interesting stories that's it number six civilization 